Okay, good evening, everybody. Welcome to this another session of 46th Comprehensive Course on Echocardiography. I'm Dr. Rakesh Gupta. I'm going to talk about approach to cardiomyopathy in today's session. Well, most important thing for any cardiopathy in India is you have to have a very high end of suspicion. You need to know about history. Then you have to go for clinical examination. X-ray chest and ECG, they are very important. And echocardiography is really diagnostic number of times. <clears throat> then in approach, we have to rule out certain very important things like we need to rule out a lung diseases, systolic LV dysfunction, which we do by coronary versus non-coronary. Then we have a diastolic heart failure consisting of diabetes, hypertension, aging populations, valvular diseases, whether it's mitral or aortic, or maybe anything else. Apart from that, another important thing is we have a pericardial diseases like pericardial effusion, pericarditis, which could be constrictive, or effusive constrictive pericarditis. Then we have arrhythmogenic RV dysplasia, and this we'll be talking about when we talk of the right heart lesions. What is exactly cardiopathy is? Cardiopathy is a cardiomyopathy which is caused by involvement of heart muscles. And majority of time it's idiopathic and it causes significant increase in mortality as well as morbidity. That is the most important thing which the cardiomyopathy does when we talk of <clears throat> these kind of things. Next important issue comes, what are the varieties of cardiomyopathies? Well, if you really ask me, we can go and talk of number of varieties of cardiomyopathies, but at your level, what I'll talk about, I'll talk about dilated, hypertrophic and restrictive cardiomyopathies. In this, Apart from that, there are two important things which are very, very important when we talk about all these kind of things is, one is a left ventricular non-compaction, which is in a variety of a dilated cardiopathy and arrhythmogenic right ventricular dysplasias. I'll be covering non-compaction in this particular moment. Now, arrhythmogenic right ventricular dysplasia, we will be talking subsequently when we'll talk of other type of cardiopathies during right heart lesions. <clears throat> what did this disease cause? This is a disease of heart muscle that causes heart muscles to become enlarged, thick or rigid. Here is enlargement. Here is thickness in hypertrophy and is rigidity in restrictive cardiomyopathy. They can have many causes, signs and symptoms and some people, they never have symptoms. As cardiomyopathy progresses over a period of time, the heart becomes weaker and weaker. It is less able to pump blood through the body and maintain normal electrical rhythms. This can lead to heart failure or arrhythmias. Either of these two things can happen over a period of time. Let's talk of one by one. Dilated cardiomyopathy is a disease that affects heart muscles. In this, the heart muscles becomes thin, especially the left ventricle becomes enlarged or dilated, and the heart is unable to squeeze efficiently, reducing the amount of blood that is pumped to the body so that end diastolic volume significantly increases over a period of time. Here is a cartoon talking of normal heart versus dilated heart. As we can see, the other chambers, they could be normal as shown in this particular picture, but as the dilated cardiomyopathy progresses over a period of time, even the right ventricular dilatation starts happening. So we can have two chamber dilatation or we can have four chamber dilatation. Hypertrophy may or may not be there. I'll come down over a period of time. Valves, they are normal. And whatever the regurgitation happened, that regurgitation happens because of annular dilatations, whether the annular dilatation happens because of left ventricle or right ventricle in four chamber dilatations. What is the role of echocardiography? Large role of echocardiography is present when we talk of 
dilated cardiopathies. We need to assess his diagnosis and severity. Then we have to talk, talk about certain prognostic factors, hemodynamic information, guide to management, follow up and rule out other causes when they are associated with. Then we have variable clinical presentations in dilated cardiomyopathies, especially as we saw a number of times, people presented with dilated cardiomyopathy, the people represented with pericardial effusions. So various kind of presentations are present. The people they make it remain asymptomatic is a very important phenomenon why the people they become remain asymptomatic. Recovering from viral myocarditis, again presenting at heart failure. Dyspnea and exertion is a common thing which is present with. Striking manifestation, those of ventricular failure, right ventricular failure, when it happens, it's really a prognostic, poor prognostic sign. In our country, toxic metabolic infectious, but we see a lot of people suffering from diabetes, mellitus, hypertension, Infections as viral, we saw a number of times. We do see alcoholic in the eastern part of India, a lot of alcoholic cardiopathies. Postpartum, very few we do see, but all of them, they looks like dilated cardiopathy. Couple of you sitting over here may be thinking, why I'm talking of hypertension in dilated cardiopathy? Well, in hypertension, to begin with, it's hypertensive, it dilated, it's not dilated is thicken myocardium. But over a period of time, when the heart is not able to push, it start dilating and giving rise to hypertensive dilated cardiopathies. So what are the features for dilated cardiopathy? We have a cardiac enlargements, all of us will understand. Global LV hypoconasis, rather than localized wall motion abnormalities, I'll, I'll talk about in a few minutes. Then we have leading impaired cardiac functions, dilatation of annulized leading to mitral regurgitations, and finally the RV involvement over a period of time. This is what the common features of echo in dilated cardiopathy is. We have a normal wall thickness, except for people who come from hypertensive heart disease, leading to final dilatations. Then we can have a two or four chamber dilatations. And if it's four chamber, that is the end stage four chamber dilated cardiopathy. Most important thing is the LV dilates in short axis rather than long axis. Why? Because apex is fixed and the base where the valves are present, atrials are present, that's also reasonably a fixed areas. So where do we dilate? We dilate in the mid segments. As we all grow, where do we dilate? When our head is fixed, the lower limbs are fixed, we dilate in our abdomen. So we dilate the LV dilates in short axis and that's what the dilatation happens. When this LV dilates in short axis, the so-called bullet shape of LV becomes globular. When it's become globular, what does it happen? It leads to a reduction of ejection fraction and a fractional shortening too. This too leads to again E-point septal separation, which is becomes more than seven or eight millimeters. When a lot of blood goes from LV to LA due to mitral regurgitation. We have a gradually systolic closure of aortic valve on M mode. And when a lot of blood is present in LA and LV, leading to either grade two, grade three, or grade four diastolic dysfunctions. As the annulus dilate, we could have mitral regurgitation or tricuspid regurgitations. These are all because of dilated annulus. Abnormal filling pattern. And finally, the abnormal flow pattern in LV leading to spontaneous echo contrast and increased mural thrombi. Let's see one by one. Normally what happens in a normal substance, this is a bullet shaped LV. The blood from LA goes to LV and from LV the blood goes to aorta. So this is a circular rings or a vertices are formed, which leads to sending a blood from LA to LV and then going to aorta. When LV dilates, the blood keeps on revolving around in LV and some of the blood goes from LVOT. And that's what 
is importance of vertices is in LV contraction. And these vertices, they reduce to quite a large extent during dilated cardiac breathes or reduced ejection fraction, the heart failure with reduced ejection fractions. Fortunately, this is work one world work, which is I'm planning to do back in India. I was in Italy. I am in Italy right now. Talking of these vertices formation in LV cavity. And fortunately, we are going to do this research work in the original form. Back in India, in a multi-center, multi-country trials around the world. I happened to visit Padua University in Italy to work on this hyperdoppler project. That's what exactly this vertices formation is. How this the blood goes from LA to LV and from LV to IOTA. And similarly, this is to we are going to study in the next six months to one year. Now let's see how these dilated LV. This is, I'll have show a couple of more pictures. This is the LV which is dilated, so is the LV which is dilated. And we happen to see a generalized reduction in LV systolic contraction. And this reduction in LV systolic contraction and there's a dilatation of LA over here. Now you can see very beautifully, this is a strain imaging, a variety of a strain imaging time to LV contraction. And you can see a significant reduction in LV contractions. And in this, RVRA appears to be a little preserved, but LALV, they are appears to be dilated. And that's what we look for in dilated cardiopathies. Many of the persons would like to ask, what is an LV dimensions to talk about dilated cardiopathy? I say, remember, 22 millimeter per meter square body surface area of LA, more than that and 32 millimeters per meter body surface area in plaques window, in basal anterior segment and basal posterior wall, when we call them as dilated, 22 and more than 32 in LV, and then we will call off dilated cardiopathies. We have often seen variety of a dilated cardiopathies where LV dimensions remain so normal, but the function reduces significantly. Then second important feature is the filling patterns. Look over here, we can very well see that E wave is almost 113 and A wave is only 20. So that E to E prime ratio is more than two or 2.5. But on top of that, look at the deceleration time, which is less than 130 milliseconds. As Dr. Devika told about last time, anything where E to E prime ratio becomes more than two and the deceleration time less than become 130, we talk of a restrictive or grade three diastolic dysfunctions. Now the next question comes, cardiomyopathy could be a coronary artery disease or ischemic cardiomyopathy. And how does we differentiate these uh, ischemic cardiomyopathies? We could have a regional hypokinesis with akinesis. We could have a scarred segment of tissues. I'm going to show you a couple of pictures. Then imaging of cardiomyopathy by transesophageal or EBCT or a coronary calcium scoring. Tissue Doppler imaging, we look at the variable annular velocities. And then the spackle imaging helps you differentiate generalized versus differentially reduced two dimension stain to differentiate between DCM and ischemic cardiomyopathy. So, what we look for hypokinesis of the regional abnormalities, presence of a scar tissue, then presence of a calcium scoring, tissue Doppler imaging, and spackle imaging, apart from coronary angiograms. In today's circumstances, if you really ask me, if I get a dilated cardiopathy in my patients, I'll stabilize them first, then try to look at all these methods which I've shown you over here, and still finally proving it, I always go for a coronary angiograms. Here's a pictorial diagram. This is normal when you see LV cavity. Then this is where the scarring happens. And when this kind of a scarring happens, 
दिस इज अटी ऑफ स्कीमिक खाद्य उत्पत्ति वी डू स्पेक्टल इमेजिंग दीज काइंड ऑफ पॉपुलेशन इफ यू सी दिस स्कोर और टू डायमेंशन स्ट्रेन विच इज यूनिफॉर्मली सेम एंड कलर देन वी से इट्स नॉर्मल If it's uniformly reduced, then is dilated cardiomyopathy, and if it's a variable kind of a pattern, we call them as ischemic cardiomyopathies. Next comes alcoholic cardiomyopathies, direct toxic effect of metabolites, nutritional effects, and toxic effect of additives. Then we have a variety of right-sided cardiomyopathies. where the rv gets also involved automatically and how does the rv gets involved automatically when we have involvement of left ventricular left atrium and finally the rv and ra and similarly in this subset of populations when we see rv involvement and this is an apical hypertrophy giving rise to Uh, subsequent dilated cardiomyopathies then we have often heard a word reversible or takasubo cardiomyopathies here is an example of a same patients where we saw a patient having a reversible or so called a takasubo cardiomyopathy initially you could see a function which is significantly reduced and size becomes smaller or normal over a period of time and this kind of phenomena has been possible now now this slide is almost 7 year old but this kind of phenomena has been possible now with the use of rnes or secubitral reverse sarton combinations when we started saying that these cardiomyopathy they become reversible cardiomyopathies over a period of time dobetem it helps in deciding in ischemic versus dilated cardiomyopathy in dobetem if you give them a dobetem If the segment which is hypokinetic becomes normokinetic, it means we are dealing with ischemic cardiomyopathy. Or a segment which is hypokinetic become akinetic, then possibly we are dealing with ischemic cardiomyopathy. If the uniform increase in a systolic contraction, then that is possibly dilated cardiomyopathy. Similarly, if you have an increase in the severity of MR, possibly we are dealing with non-ischemic cardiomyopathies. then what are the prognostic factor if you look at this slide very carefully what are the prognostic factor is how much my end diastolic volume is how much my degree of dysfunction is what is the wall thickness of the ventricle is what is the rv size and function is ventricular shape pulmonary artery hypertension and what kind of failing pattern these patients they are presenting with that all leads to a cumulative mortality and morbidity this one question i often ask when i am talking of dilated cardiomyopathy a person who has got a ejection fraction of 25% with this kind of ejection fraction one patient is moving around normally with a grade 1 or grade 2 nh5 dyspnea other patient is almost bedridden with grade 3 grade 4 nh5 dyspnea why why it's so anybody who would like to answer this question will open up his mic and say that otherwise i'll go ahead and tell you why well let's go back to the previous slide look this in lv function is almost 25% right it all depends on the falling pressures one by one i have told you everything if my restrictive falling patterns are present with uh, la pressures have become high if my rv has become dilated it means my rv dysfunction has set in if my ra rv ra systolic pressures become high it means the patient has gone to right sided phase and if my ra is dilated and ivc is become dilated this is biventricular failure because of a 25 percent ejection fraction. Then these are the people who are almost bedridden. So it's all depends on failing patients. What do you do in these subset of population? 
just a line of fluoride. We give them a decongestive therapy. If we suspect ischemic pathology, obviously the aspirin should be added to the treatment. And then once these patient stabilizes, obviously we have been deficient in the various pathologies. We can do dobutamine echo, tissue doppler imaging or two dimension stain for a viability, or we take them patient directly once stabilization. What do we mean by stabilization? Decongestive them, congest them so that they become a little bitter from a grade two, grade three NHYA dysmia. And then take them for a corneal angiogram. And if it's normal, obviously, we look for a medical therapy, ICD or bioventricular pacemaker implantation. I'd like to add one more thing over here that has become very, very important into these circumstances is the use of army therapy in this kind of a patients of dilated cardiopathies. The JUST guidelines published in 2002, uh, 2022 in May in General of American College of Cardiology, please read those guidelines to talk of medical therapy in dilated cardiopathy or heart failure with reduced ejection fractions. Let's move on from dilated cardiopathy to hypertrophic cardiopathy. Is a condition of muscles disease in which the muscles become really, really thick or thickened. The thickening usually occurs in the lower, lower left chamber of the heart called left ventricle. Thickening of the heart muscle can occur in the septum, muscular wall that separates the left ventricle with the right, and posterior or free wall. And it could be isolated with the apex or throughout the entire ventricle. When muscles become thickened, it may make it difficult for the efficient amount of blood from in and out of the heart, especially during exercise. And in some of the cases, thickening muscle can block blood flow from the left ventricular, so-called the outflow tract obstructions. Here is the cartoon or a pictorial diagram talking of significant left ventricular hypertrophy. It's a genetic disorder, one out of 5,500 people. Then one out of 10 gene that encodes the protein of cardiac sarcomeres, resulting in unexplained hypertrophy of a cardiac muscles, usually congenital. We have recently identified about seven varieties of hypertrophic cardiopathies. What we are really interested for is a predominant septal hypertrophy with after development of dynamic LVOT obstructions. So here is a picture again. There's a normal heart versus significantly hypertrophic interventricular septum and posterior wall. It could be obstructive versus non-obstructive. How does the patient present so it? Majority of these patients again asymptomatic. And you often detect them by hearing some sound or some changes in ECG suggestive of LVH. And some of the people who present with dyspnea, palpitation, angina, syncope, or pre syncoping And since it sometimes gets undetected, the sudden cardiac death is a very important feature in these subset of populations. Again, differential diagnosis to differentiate with hypertension, people undergoing hemodialysis or chronic kidney diseases. This is very common, these people presenting with chronic kidney diseases having a picture similar like hypertrophic cardiomyopathies. Then you can have an athlete heart because of aortic stenosis or obstruction at the level of aorta or the aortic valve. Then newborns, infant, born to diabetic mothers, then tumor invading interventricular septum, then mural thrombi against interventricular septum, and then LV of the obstruction is initially hypertrophic cardiopathy and then dilated cardiopathy. Look at this picture very carefully. This picture has got septum as well as posterior wall, which is uniformly thickened. And look at this septum over here is 3.07, and the posterior wall is 4.28 centimeters. No, not 4.28, 3.07 centimeter again, the posterior wall also. So is a uniform hypertrophic left ventricular. So there's no septal posterior wall hypertrophy with a relation of 1.5 is to 1. 
And when you look at this kind of a picture, where we see absolutely a normal flow across mitral valve as well as aortic valve with uniform hypertrophy, what all features they come to your mind is. I'll say at this point, number of features which come to my mind is either this person. <laughs> Please silent your mic. Please silent your mic. <laughs> So you happen to look at this. This was Dr. Ankan Patel who had unmuted his mic. So Dr. Ankan, please take care of it. So if you look at this septum and the posterior wall, they're significantly thickened. Look at the mitral flow pattern, which is reasonably normal. And there's a uniform hypertrophy of septum, which is 1.8 versus 1.6 centimeter in thickness. So these are the people who are because of hypertrophic cardiopathies. And what are the possible features for hepatitis, hypertrophic cardiopathy, which is non-obstructive in the subset of population is? What all will come into my mind would be the first, hypertension per se, chronic kidney diseases, aortic stenosis, and then comes coarctation of aortas. And these people, they present like this over a period of time. Another one example, same, look very carefully. LV appears to be thickened. There's some amount of pericardial effusion which is present over here. Here you list, look at the thickening of LV and there's no obstruction of LVOT. And when we look for a flow pattern across this LVOT or aortic valve, this is reasonably normal. There is shorter acceleration time and a longer deceleration time. Then E point septal separation, again, it's normal. Moving on from a variety of hypertrophic non-obstructive cardiomyopathy, there's a variety which is known as apical hypertrophy. And if you look at carefully, this apex, which becomes hypertrophic, here the bases which are spared. So again, this is a variety of non-obstructive cardiomyopathy. And it can be very beautifully seen with three uh, dimensions echocardiography, where we can see a really good amount of tissue is apex, which is hypertrophic. <clears throat> this is with the change of a B scan colors. Many of you must be having a B scan color in your machine so that you can change this in B scan colors to look at the tuned up picture of apical non-obstructive cardiomyopathies. This is a three dimensional pictures talking of from base to apex. Here is the base, which is significantly hypertrophic. As we move from base to apex, uh, sorry, apex to base, here is base, we can see that the bases are spared, but the apex are significantly hypertrophic. One more thing which we often see non-obstructive cardiomyopathy is when we look at the thickened sigmoid septum, this is a thickened sigmoid septum. It's not going to produce any significant obstruction to LVOT. And this is a variety of, again, hypertrophic non-obstructive cardiomyopathy. Then one variety where we have obstruct, non-obstructive cardiomyopathy is at reach heart. LV wall thickness, almost 14 millimeters, genetic testing, familial studies, pulse wave Doppler study at a mitral wall, E point, septal sub, E prime is more than seven centimeters. We have a sometime a large cavity. The most important thing is the LV wall regression becomes normal once these people, they become deconditioned over a period of time. Now comes a true, the most important part of hypertrophic obstructive cardiomyopathies. What we have is symmetrical septal hypertrophy, septal posterior wall ratio more than 1.5 is to 1. 
Presence of a systolic anti-emotional or anti-mitral leaflets, which should be seen by M mode in two dimensions Doppler. And then the dynamic LV obstruction with preserved LV systolic function tell last it is. So we have ASH, we have SAM, and dynamic LVOT obstructions. Let's see one by one what these dynamic LVOT obstructions are. Now, this is how we do it. We cut a cut at the tip of the mitral leaflets. What do we get? We get an M mode. Then look for this M mode. How does this M mode behaves like? Here is systole, here is diastole. In diastole, we have mitral opening and closing. AML and PML over here. In diastole, we have mitral opening and closing. Here is AML, here is PML. But look at in between, in diastole, we have the systolic anti emotion of the mitral leaflets. Can you see this systolic anti emotion of the mitral leaflet? And then this moves up during systole. That's what we have seen over here. The mitral remains unguarded, leaving to mid-systolic MR, and on top of that, this systolic anti-motion material leaflet anteriorly will lead to a dynamic LVOT obstructions. Again, a classical example. Here is diastole, is a zoomed up picture. This is E and this is A wave, and end. So this is where the diastole starts. Between these two diastole, the systolic anti emotion of the mitral leaflet, SAM, or SAM, which is present in this population. When this SAM is present, it gives rise to mid systolic MR. Now look at this pointer over here and look at this mid systolic MR seen over here. And same thing is early systolic MR seen in the subcenter population. Now look at this film very, very carefully. Concentrate on this particular valve. And I'll try to freeze this valve. This valve moves during systole towards the LVOT. And when we move towards systole towards LVOT, the mitral valve remains unguarded, leading to torrential MR. And when this leaves unguarded to torrential MR, if you put a conserved volume across this LVOT, what do we get? We get dynamic LVOT obstruction. What do you mean by dynamic? This is a long exhalation time and a shorter desolation time. And some people they call is as dragger shape. Because as the mitral valve, the, as the systole happen, this mitral was sucked into LVOT. And which happened to suck into LVOT is not in the beginning only, in the mid systole, leading to obstruction or sub LVOT obstruction. And that's what exactly it does, leading to almost six meters of a flow gradient across this mountain valley. How does the difference from aortic stenosis? Look, this is what the systolic anti motion of the mitral leaflet leading to dynamic LVOT gradient. So we have a short, longer exhalation time. But in contrast in aortic stenosis, we have a very short exhalation time and long distillation times. Again, a picture talking of systolic anterior mitral leaflets, dynamic LVOT obstruction, and some amount of mitral vegetation, which is seen over here. So we have ASH, 1.5 is to 1, symmetrical hypertrophy with posterior wall, small LV cavity, systolic anti emotion of metal wall leaflets, dynamic elevated obstruction of at least more than 25, and then mid systolic MR, which are our diagnostic feature of hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. And if you can't produce this dynamic LVOT hypertrophy, just do a provocative measures. You can give them a nitrates. So the preload and afterload reduces. You can look at the post-extra systolic beat 
or ask the patient to do a valsalva maneuver. And I've told you about this valsalva maneuver is ask the patient to hold his breath during end expirations. Ask them to hold for longer durations. And when they ask to hold them longer duration, obviously these people, they go to valsalva. Then what are the clinical assessment for prognosis? Younger age, poor prognosis. Malignant family history, very poor prognosis. If the patient has got a history of syncope, and if we document VT, then obviously they have poor prognostic features. Since 2009, we have started looking for certain important prognostic features in this subset of operations. High E to B prime ratio, large LA volumes, high pro BNP levels, cardiac MRI to rule out psychosis or a tissue which is arrhythmogenic, then longitudinal radial stains and exercise induced LVOT gradients. Here is a picture of E to E prime ratio. If you have E to E prime ratios low versus high E to E prime ratio, look at the event tree survival. So, similarly, if you have low BNP versus high BNP, look at the cumulative or event tree survival in this subset of operations. The people who have got a high BNP versus high E2 prime ratio, they have less event-free survivals in the subset of populations. Then comes LA volumes. If your LA volume is more than 39 cc versus less than 39 cc, if it's less than 39 versus more than 39, look at this event-free survival. If the LA volume keeps on going high, obviously these are the people who have got poor prognosis. So low E2 prime ratio, as well as high E2 prime ratio with BNP levels, with this LA volumes gives you an excellent idea about the prognosis. Here is example, we have low E2 prime ratio BNP level is versus high E2 prime ratio versus BNP levels of hypertrophic cardiomyopathies. So, management issues. Idea is to reduce LVOT gradients. And how do we do it? We can do it by pharmacotherapy, dual tumor pacing, refractory cases, septal ethylene ablations, and myomectomies. And what do we do? We look at an LAD first branch of LAD, selectively inject alcohol to this particular artery so that the basal anterior septum gets, which is hypertrophic, becomes less hypertrophic or die down over a period of time, leading to all of gradients. And here is an example for septal alcohol ablations. This is before and this is after alcohol ablations. We can see a CAT study at the same time. Baseline, we had more than 200 millimeters of LVOT gradients, which has dropped down to less than 150 at 160 after doing septal alcohol ablations. Similarly, myomectomy is another very good way of looking at these people for reducing their LVOT gradients. So survival-free periods from hypertrophic-related deaths, non-operated obstructive versus myomectomy. If you put them on myomectomy, they do better with surgical process. And similarly, the sudden cardiac death, once they had myomectomy was much lesser than non-operated people who were suffering from this abnormality. There's one more very important variety of hypertrophic obstructive cardiomyopathy. Unfortunately, the obstruction is not at the level of LVOT. The obstruction is at the level of mid cavity. Now look at this carefully. The gradients are present at the level of mid cavity. Now many of you will ask me, how do I look at the mid cavity gradients? It's a very simple phenomena is, you take a pulse worm sample volume, and put this pulse wave sample volume at the tip of the mitral leaflet and gradually move towards the apex. And when you will reach over here, you will suddenly start finding that the Doppler spectrum pattern is not contained by pulse wave Doppler spectrum patterns. So, variety of apical hypertrophy. What is the management issue? Can we do apical myomectomy? We have not heard much about this apical myomectomy. We look at this apical myomectomy, uh, hypertrophy and treat them medically. Then another one important variety of 
hypertrophic cardiomyopathy is when we have a caudal SAM. What do you mean by caudal SAM? The cords which are attached to the tip of the mitral valve leaflet gets into the LVOT and they produces an endiamic LVOT obstruction. That's what is known as caudal SAMs. This is one variety which is very, very important. Mm -hmm. which differentiate between dilated and hypertrophic varieties. This is known as non-compaction of LV. What does this non-compaction of LV is? The LV cavity gets trabaculations. And what these trabaculations are, you are able to see a multiple sieve-like structures into the LV cavities in the myocardium. And what these sieve-like structures look like? You look at these sieve-like structures over here, multiple sieve-like structures over here. And we call them as non-compaction of LV when intertubercular space is directly filled with blood from a ventricular cavity. And this is known as non-compacted cardiopathies. Now look at very careful, there appears to be something like hypertrophic, but they have a sieve-like structures in between them going all the way to all the myocardium. And majority of time, these kind of a non-compaction of LVs are, the apex appears hypertrophic, but the bases are usually spared in the sub-variety of dilated cardiopathy. Now look at this picture very, very carefully. I'll spend a few minutes time over here. These are sieves or the non-compacted segments where the blood you can see traveling all the way in between these sieves, producing a classical picture of non-compacted of LV. We look at this non-compacted LV and now this is a three-dimensional cycle with the cut sections. You can see this sieves kind of a structure in the apex. Similarly, you can see the blood is just going into these sieves or non-compacted segments to call them as a non-compaction of LV. At one time, these were known as spongy myocardiums. This is very classical pictures of this non-compaction of LV. You can look at this kind of uh, non-compacted segments, which are virtually hanging up like the multiple thrombi. So again, a variety of non-compaction of LV. This non-compaction of LV could be because of LV as well as RV. Now you can see this non-compaction in RV apart from LV. And here's the multiple C which are seen in RV in this subset of populations. So that is what a variety which often gets confused with hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. But this is not a hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. It's a variety of dilated cardiomyopathy where the LV is dilated. But the apical segment, which appears to be hypertrophic, they have this sieve-like pattern, which we call them as non-compaction of LV. Let's move on to a very other modality is restrictive cardiomyopathies. What is restrictive cardiomyopathy is? It's the disease which affects heart muscles and the heart becomes rigid and unable to fill and relax with that. The function of the heart may be normal, but relaxation is very, very important, which is abnormal. When lower left chamber of the heart, called as left ventricle, is unable to stretch and fill blood, pressure builds up, causing abnormal rhythms, as well as symptoms of heart failures. Here is the example for this. The restrictive cardiomyopathy is, if you look at this LV and RV, there appears to be normal in size. But the LA and RA becomes bigger in size and LV becomes really, really stiff so that neither it relaxes to receive blood and nor able to push blood properly. So what we, the most important thing is when we look at a thickened LV, we look at a flow pattern of these things. And if you happen to find a grade two or grade three diastatic dysfunction or restrictive filling pattern, that is what we call them as, we call them as restrictive cardiomyopathies. What is the sequence of this restrictive cardiomyopathy is very rarely available or seen. Basic hemodynamic abnormality is increased myocardial and endocardial stiffness, leading to improper relaxation, 
and when this improper relaxation happens, leads to impaired feeling of LV. When the LV gets impaired feelings, the abnormally high feeling pressures, the LFA pressures becomes high, leading to pulmonary congestion, distension of central veins, hepatic distension, and finally the pedal edema. So this is a sequence of development of pedal edema in this population. Varieties, if you look at the varieties of restrictive cardiopathy, they go to primary or secondary. Primary, all of us understand endomyocardial fibrosis or Laffler syndromes. Secondary is infiltrative, and we have talked about a lot in amyloidosis, sarcoidosis, post radiations, they are a few varieties. And then we have a secondary of a storage diseases presenting as restrictive cardiopathy. In this patient, usually, usually presents with pedal edema or features of right-sided congestive cardiac failures. Then in this variety, you can have a hypertrophy due to infiltration, that amyloidosis, glycogenesis disease, thalassemia. It could be seen in cardiac transplant rejection patients, rarely pyopyatic cardiac, and another active fibrillation is another method of another variety of restrictive cardiopathies. What are the features? We have a normal size LV and RV. We have preserved LV systolic functions. We may have a normal or increased LV wall thickness, but there's a bi-atrial overload and restrictive filling pattern in this subset of population with dilated IVC and decreased in respiratory collapse because of raised RA pressures. Now look at this picture very carefully. This is a patient who is in atrial fibrillation. His LV is dilated, LV wall thickness is normal, and LV function appears to be normal. RV is reasonably normal or triangular shape structure attached to LV, contracting very well. And if you put in a Doppler flow pattern across this metal line, you see a top sharp E wave and a small A wave with a deceleration time of less than 150 milliseconds, giving rise to a restrictive filling pattern in the subset of operation. Now you can see a Juma picture where LV and RV, they are normal in size, but LA and RA, they are increased in size. We have some amount of martial registration and we have some amount of tricuspid registration in subset population. We have a restrictive filling pattern and we have learned last week E to E prime ratio. And here, if the E wave is almost 10 or 8, and here is E prime ratio is 4 or 5, if it's 8, this is 4, then it's E to E prime ratio of more than 20, suggesting that this is a restrictive filling pattern in this subset of population. There's bi atrial overload. And that's being depicted over here by the formula of 22 into 23 and 0.85 divided by shorter of these two lengths, that is six centimeters to give you a restrictive filling patterns. One word before I stop it over here is, we have a number of features which resemble restricted versus constructions. Although we are going to talk about all these things when we're talking about right-sided features, where we are going to talk about arrhythmogenic right ventricular dysplasia, as well as this constriction versus restriction. Apart from PEO, pericardium, pericardium, pericardial effusion, and other factors. One important feature which is not seen in restrictive cardiopathy is the septal bounds. Second, there's no pericardial thickness in restrictive cardiopathy. And the important part is when you take an E2 prime ratio, which is very, very high in restricted cardiopathy, but in constrictive pericarditis, it's very small because if you look at the septum, E2 prime, the relaxation, there's no abnormalities. So E2 prime velocity of septum and E wave is much, much shorter in length, where it is significantly increased in restrictive or cardiopathy. So I'll stop it over here and take up all of your questions about dilated, hypertrophic, non-compaction, and restrictive cardiopathy. And today, like many of us, we are looking for genetic testing in people who are possibly suspecting of familial abnormalities. So I'll stop one by one over here and take up your questions for this particular phenomenon of cardiopathy. And that's what the most important thing is.